Hello ballooners, welcome to my competition ballooning explained series. Competitive ballooning can be a very daunting prospect to get involved in, especially for those with no previous experience. This series is designed to be a learning tool for pilots that are wanting to compete and get involved and also as a reference for crew or spectators that just want to learn more about the sport. In this first episode we'll be talking about the task data sheet. Let's get into it. task data sheet, sometimes shortened to TDS, is issued to each competitor and official before a competition flight. It will be accompanied by a briefing where the event director, that's this guy, will go through the information on the sheet and answer any questions. The event director can also make changes during the briefing if they choose, such as cancelling tasks or changing and clarifying the specific parameters for a task. Task data sheets come in different styles, normally dependent on the director but the general layout and key information is always the same, made up of two parts, flight data and the task data. The flight data will define several things, starting with the launch area, which will either be a common launch area, sometimes called common launch point, where all balloons launch together, or an individual launch point, ILP for short, where the pilots must find their own launch site for that flight, in the case of an ILP, the flight data will also define the minimum distance away from the targets that the pilots must launch from. In the case of a common launch area, the director can provide a grid reference on the task sheet or list one of the CLAs or CLPs provided to pilots at an earlier stage, normally the general briefing. There are slight differences between CLAs and CLPs, but for our purposes and the scope of this video, they can be treated as the same. This task sheet here has CLA1 listed as the launch site, so it will be a common launch, and the director has left the minimum ILP to goals field blank, as it doesn't apply here. In this other example, the director has specified an individual launch, and has therefore defined the minimum distance from all the goals that we need to launch from, one kilometre. Note this applies to all goals on the task sheet, not just this first task. Next thing to be defined is the launch period, which can either be set as a fixed time period in the case of an individual launch, as we see here. In the case of a common launch, the director will start the launch by raising a green flag at the signals pole. So on the task sheet, the launch period will be shown as green flag plus an amount of time. In our first example, 30 minutes. Teams can prepare their balloons on the ground, but not start the cold inflation until the green flag. After this, they are free to cold, hot inflate, and launch at their choice during the launch period. For individual launches, it is slightly different, and teams can hot inflate before the launch period starts, just not take off. Moving along the task sheet, we also have official sunrise and sunset which is actually not important for competition purposes, except that all tasks must be completed before sunset. Then we have PZs in force. Each competition will have a published list of PZs, short for prohibited zones, where competitors will receive penalties for flying through or landing in. The event director can choose to deactivate one or more PZs for a particular flight, as in this example here, where PZ11 is not active. Most of the time this section will just say all active, as in our first example. The next briefing section is self-explanatory, it's the time of the briefing for the next competition flight. However, it's important to note that this does not include any supplementary briefings for the current flight, which the director can call, either by mentioning during the briefing that there will be an additional briefing and giving a time and a place, or in the case of a common launch, by raising a pink flag at the signals pole. A supplementary briefing is an important tool for director to once again be able to make changes to the task data sheet, but with the most up-to-date MET information available. The last piece of flight data that all task sheets will include is solo flight, which if required means the pilot cannot fly with another member of their crew. They can request to fly a competition official 
if they don't wish to fly alone. If the TAS data sheet says solo flight not required, as it does in our example, this does not mean that you have to fly with someone else in the basket. You can fly solo if you want to, it's just up to you. A quick side note on loggers. Most competitions will use loggers to score competitors. These will provide tracks of the pilot's flight to officials and some loggers will also record virtual marker drops and declarations that the pilot inputs. I'll go into more detail on these loggers in future videos. For now I will leave some learning tutorials in the description for the two most common types of loggers uh, that are used at the moment which is the FAI logger and the Balloon Live app. There are also events that are scored with an observer which is an independent official that follows each team either in the balloon or in the chase crew. However, observer events are rarely seen outside of Japan nowadays, so I won't cover this for now. Anyway, back to the task sheet. Another piece of flight data that can appear is Q and H, such as that in our example, which can be necessary to input into the logger used for scoring. This will depend on the logger being used to score your event, so make sure to check that. Lastly, some task data sheets will include a search period which is no longer relevant to logger scoring events, so this can be ignored if you are at a logger scoring event. I intend to make videos for each type of task and cover most of the task data for those tasks then. However, we can take a look at some of the task data now as it applies to all tasks, such as the scoring period, which is simply the time by when you must complete the task in order to achieve a result. In our example, it ends at green flag plus 60 minutes. However, it's far more common for just a time to be listed here, such as in this example. There is also the scoring area, which is where you can achieve a result for the task. In our example, we have entire contest area, which is normally a 40 by 40 kilometer square that covers the whole planned flying area for the competition. This can sometimes be a restricted scoring area or limited scoring area where the director can set out a specific shape, for example, in a field where the competitor can only achieve a result by getting their marker within this scoring area. Outside of it is a no result. The last piece of information that all tasks will have to find is the task order. In our example, we only have one task for the flight, so this doesn't need to be defined. However, in this task sheet, we have multiple tasks, and we can see that they are all specified to be flown in order, which means they must be completed in the order that they are on the task sheet. In this example, however, all the tasks have been listed as in any order, which means, as it says, that the task can be flown in any order that the pilots want to. This can add a layer of complexity and strategy to the flight, trying to find the most optimal order to fly the tasks, with some tasks being advantageous to fly earlier or later in the flight. But what if some tasks on my task sheet are in order and others are in any order? How does that work? Well, that's what we have in this case. We need to fly the first two tasks in order, because that's what it says on the task sheet, but the other two tasks we can fly at whichever point of the flight we want. I like to think of them as moving parts that we can pick up and move around the task sheet and put them at the top or even in between the first two tasks, just so long as the order of the first two tasks doesn't change. You also have noticed that the last task has this phrase, in any order but not split. This only applies to tasks that have multiple parts to them, and it means once we've started that task, in this case by pressing logger mark 4, we must complete it by pressing logger mark 5 before we can move on to a different task. We cannot split the task by flying another task in between logger mark 4 and logger mark 5. Well, that's the important stuff covered on the task data sheet. I wanted to go straight into looking at the tasks themselves, but I thought it was important to first make sure we all had a good understanding of the task sheet itself. Please feel free to share this video with anyone you think may find it useful and also any feedback is welcome in the comments. I hope you found this helpful, I wish you good luck in your flying and goodbye for now.